there are many people in Northern Ireland, perhaps a majority, who can still remember uh, violence and, and terrorism in Northern Ireland, which was put an end to largely by the Good Friday Agreement. It, it ought to be a, a particular priority of the government um, to look after the safety of its citizens um, rather than to uh, use Northern Ireland and the Northern Ireland Protocol uh, as a theatre of operations in, in its civil war. I'm Brendan Donnelly, Director of the Federal Trust, and today I'd like to talk about the current negotiations on the Northern Irish Protocol. I think that these negotiations symbolise and summarise a lot of what's fundamentally wrong with Brexit. The first problem is that this Northern Irish Protocol is being discussed exclusively in terms of the internal politics of the Conservative Party. Will Mr Sunak be able to persuade the ERG to support him? Will Boris Johnson use these negotiations as an opportunity to mount a coup against his successor but one? There's nothing new about this. Uh, all of Brexit has simply been a collateral damage for the United Kingdom from the internal squabbling and feuds of the Conservative Party. In 2010, David Cameron hoped to be able to put an end, put a lid uh, on these squabbles. For a couple of years, he had some success. But in the middle of that parliament, he found that it was impossible any longer to suppress uh, the Eurosceptic momentum within his own party. He thought he'd come up with a clever wheeze of uh, promising a referendum in the next government, uh, a promise which he probably didn't think that he'd ever have to deliver on. When, to his uh, surprise, he won in 2015, the Eurosceptics in his party came and demanded, demanded their pound of flesh. Cameron knew um, that he was running a risk in calling this referendum, but he thought he'd be able to win it. He was advised not to do it by many, including George Osborne, and yet he went ahead. He thought that in this way he'd be able to put an end to Eurosceptic controversy within the Conservative Party by winning a decisive victory. We know it didn't work out that way, and his successor, Theresa May, uh, who had the reputation uh, of being a Remainer, uh, found herself um, desperately needing to placate and please uh, the growing strength of the Eurosceptics within her own party. That made it impossible for her to deal with the European Union, to negotiate with the European Union, uh, until she was supplanted, not least because of the Northern Ireland Protocol. The Northern Ireland Protocol was a, a management problem also for B Boris Johnson, her successor. Uh, he, in order to de demonstrate that he was different to May, uh, revised the protocol in a way which was arguably worse from the British point of view. But he squared the circle by pretending that he hadn't agreed to what he had agreed to in the protocol and telling the ERG and others who would listen that the protocol would very soon be renegotiated. Sunak is now bearing the consequence uh, of that evasion and that equivocation in 2019. He can't deliver on what Boris Johnson promised. He's attempting to modify and make the pro protocol work better. Within the Conservative Party, there's a growing body of opinion which says the protocol should be scrapped altogether. That uh, is un unsustainable. The EU are not going to, to stand for it. it. But the point to make is that this debate is only being conducted within the Conservative Party. It's not the interests of the country, it's not the interests of Northern Ireland that will be decisive, it's simply the dysfunctional squabbles of the Conservative Party. The second aspect of these negotiations, which I find very typical of the Brexit debate, is that all these problems were entirely predictable. It was obvious that uh, if you were going to uh, take Northern Ireland out of the European Union, while well, the Republic of Ireland obviously remained within the European Union, that would create problems uh, for customs and for the single market. Uh, these problems were absolutely denied in spite of the fact that John Major and Tony Blair um, pointed them out in, in no uncertain terms. It was part of the whole um, self-deception of Brexit. Uh, the Northern Ireland problem wasn't really a problem at all. Uh, the Irish government uh, wouldn't have the power or the desire to be able to make a fuss about it. Uh, that last uh, assessment was particularly incorrect. Uh, the European Union was very willing to listen to the Irish government on this subject, and it was a very good example of the way in which the leverage of a relatively small country such as Ireland uh, within the European Union 
uh, can allow that country to negotiate on at least equal terms um, with the United Kingdom. That was a, a very interesting development in, in modern Irish history. And the Northern Ireland Protocol um, was a, a natural undertaking um, in order to deal with the problems which uh, the Irish government um, discerned and which they were able to persuade the rest of the Union, European Union were of national or national interest. Another aspect of the negotiations, which is typical of the Brexit process, uh, is the repetitious nature of what we're being confronted with. Uh, we went through exactly the same arguments in 2016, in 2019, and now in 2023, they've come round again. And there's a reason why this predictability and repetition occurs. It's that there are no good answers to the problems thrown up by Brexit. And the problems thrown up by Brexit for Ireland and Northern Ireland are particularly acute. Of course, it's anomalous to have a... a, a, a a part of the United Kingdom, Northern Ireland, where European legislation applies. Of course, it's anomalous to have a, a, a border effectively in the Irish Sea. Uh, to that extent, one can sympathise with the, the concerns of, of the DUP. But these are problems that are, arise from Brexit. There's no good answer to the problems posed by Bex Brexit. There's a certain trilogy which we see in the Brexit uh, analysis. One, uh, they deny that any problem exists. Two, they claim that there's a simple solution to the problem. And three, they claim that any solutions put forward to the problem are worse than no solution. That seems to be the phase at which uh, the ERG and the DUP find themselves at the moment. Sunak, I think, has moved on to the uh, fourth phase, which is to say there are no desirable solutions, no ideal solutions, but some solutions are more catastrophic than others. Uh, it'll be very interesting, and I'm afraid it's um, uh, very difficult to predict, um, to find out what's going to be the result of this clash of forces within the Conservative Party. Fourth uh, element of the negotiations, which strikes me as being typical of, of Brexit, uh, is the, the fundamental difference within the Conservative Party between those who want a, a, a pragmatic um, a reasonably friendly, a reasonably um, uh, harmonious relationship with the European Union and those who don't. There are people within the Conservative Party, influential people, who simply hate and detest the European Union. The less the United Kingdom has to do with the European Union, is the better from their point of view. There are others who are less dogmatic on the subject, and I suspect that Sunak is one of them. Sunak would like, if possible, um, to make the um, protocol work. Uh, it's a, a foregone conclusion for many in his party that it can't and shouldn't be made to work. That ambiguity goes back, of course, to the referendum itself, where Dominic Cummings, rightly from his point of view, in a tactically savvy way, refused to spell out what was the vision of the United Kingdom that he or others had in the Leave camp after Brexit. That was left deliberately vague. Some people wanted Singapore on Thames. Some people wanted very little change from the current arrangements in the United Kingdom, but simply to leave the European Union uh, and resume what they thought of as being the status quo of the 1970s. That um, ambiguity has never been resolved, um, and Ireland, Northern Ireland, is a particular victim of it. It's very tempting, looking at the Northern Ireland negotiations, to adopt a, a lofty sociological point of view. Well, it's not surprising, given the way the Conservative Party has gone about this problem, um, that Northern Ireland finds itself in, in this limbo. Uh, but it shouldn't be forgotten that um, it's not just a question of uh, economic advantage. It's also a question of, of, of political and um, personal stability within Northern Ireland. There are many people in Northern Ireland, perhaps a majority, who can still remember uh, violence and, and terrorism in Northern Ireland, which was put an end to largely by the Good Friday Agreement. It, it ought to be a, a particular priority of the government um, to look after the safety of its citizens um, rather than to uh, use Northern Ireland and the Northern Ireland Protocol uh, as a theatre of operations in, in its civil war. One of the most uh, enthusiastic advocates of Brexit in 2016 was the DUP. And they did that on the basis that they thought that Brexit perhaps might make it easier to uh, assure 
um, the, 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 the unity of the United Kingdom and the prevention of um, uh, Irish unification. Uh, there's a paradox here, one of the main paradoxes of, of Brexit, um, that far from uh, putting an end to discussion of Irish unification, Brexit in fact has given a, a new momentum to this discussion. And as long as Brexit continues to be imposed on Northern Ireland, where the great majority of the voters do not want Brexit, um, that momentum is going to increase um, and, and have further force. Uh, it would be a, a supreme irony if um, the DUP, having played their role in bringing about Brexit, found that Brexit precisely facilitated the goal that at all costs they wanted to avoid, Irish unification. In that case, they'd find the truth of the old Chinese curse May all your wishes come true.